Good evening from New York City. And I'm grateful to share this virtual space with you. So thank you for being with us for live from NYPL at home. My name is Novella Ford and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, a research center at the New York Public Library dedicated to the collection, preservation, and interpretation of materials focused on global Black experiences. And I tonight have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's program with two New York Times best-selling authors, Tayari Jones, who's the author of four novels, most recently, An American Marriage, and the indomitable Terry McMillan. Terry's new book is It's Not All Downhill From Here. It's filled with Terry McMillan's signature warmth, wisdom, deep-seated friendships, and humor. These attributes seated conversations between my then 16-year-old self and my aunt Willa as I made my way through Terry's earlier work, Mama, and eventually the blockbuster Waiting to Excel. I'm sure there are many out there who are watching who totally understand that journey. She had been scheduled, Terry McMillan that is, had been scheduled to speak in person twice at the New York Public Library, both at the Schomburg Center for our June Literary Festival, which has been postponed, but we look forward to sharing with you all a new date. And she was also supposed to speak at the Schwartzman Building. And while we were so disappointed not to be able to host her in person, we are so grateful that both she and Tiari Jones have agreed to migrate this event online. So if you haven't already, you can purchase It's Not All Downhill From Here through the library shop. Just go on to nypl.org slash shop. That's nypl.org slash shop. And while you're waiting for your book to arrive, check out some of Terry and Tiari's back catalog on our free e-reader, Simply E. If you haven't already yet, get your library card by downloading our app and signing up. And if you can't remember any of this, visit our website, www.nypl.org, and all of our digital materials are available there, starting from the homepage. So before I invite Terry and Tiari on, there are just a few quick housekeeping items I have to go over. This event is being simulcast on Zoom and YouTube. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the conversation, please bear with us and we'll sort it out as quickly as possible. I should also tell you that this event is being recorded, but only the event, that is Terry and Tiari. You are not being recorded, but you can of course close out of Zoom or close the YouTube page at any time. Tara will be glad to answer some of your questions today, and you can send them to her anytime during the conversation. If you have a question, please type it at any point into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the Zoom app. We'll make sure that Terry sees them, and though she may not be able to have time to answer everything, she will get through as many as possible. With that said, please welcome Tayari Jones, and Terry McMillan. Well, I'm Hi. so delighted to be here to talk to you, Terry, because you don't know this for, but for at least the last 20 years, you have been my best friend in my head. Oh, stop. <laughs> I'm serious. So I'm so delighted that we have this chance to talk. And I'm excited to talk about your new book, It's Not All Downhill From Here. This is your 10th novel. Is it? I think so. I was trying to count them. Mama, this Don't appears. count them. Don't count them. Don't Wait, count. I have to say, waiting to exhale. Come on. No. Yeah, okay. That's fine. But they're not like kids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm really glad you said that because sometimes people often say to me, are your books your children? And I'm thinking, no, they're my, they're my books. They're my art. Yeah. This book is such a triumph. I got to read it. Um, when it was in, you know, early edition, and I like tore through it in a day and a half. And then I gave it to the lady who works at the post office, and she tore through it in a day and a half. Because as I said on Twitter, and I meant it, I said, you know what, a new Terry McMillan novel is essential, especially now. I mean, this book just gave me something to fall into. I want to talk about it in more detail, but I wonder if you would start off by just reading to us a little bit. Oh. Please. I can see you clearly now. Yeah, because we're You know I've been a fan of yours, honey. Let me tell you. 
I wish I could do what you do. Oh, I'm starting at the beginning here, huh? This is quick. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I don't want another surprise party, which is just one reason why a few weeks ago when my husband Carl called while I was walking our dog BB King to the dog park and asked what I wanted to do for my birthday this year, I politely said, baby, let's try to figure out how we can get our second win. At first, Carl high pitched chuckled like he was a soprano or something, and then he said, well, we need a boat. I chuckled right back, even though I was serious as a heart attack. Don't you worry, Miss Lowe, I've got you covered, he said as he hung up. I knew he didn't really get my drift. What I meant was, since we both have more days behind us than we have ahead of us, how about we try to figure out what we can do to pump up the volume? It's not like our life is boring. Well, maybe it is, a little. But even though we don't do very many, excuse me, very many things that generate excitement, I still love him more than my Twizzlers. Carl is a retired contractor who refuses to retire. And after 30 years of all work and no place selling hair and beauty products and two stores too many, I don't exactly qualify as a thrill a minute either. I released B.B. King's lease inside the dog park, but he just stood there shivering as if he was waiting to be invited to participate in some activity that didn't require him to run or jump. In human years, he and I will soon be the same age, 68. His whiskers and eyebrows are peppered with gray, but unlike me, Bibi doesn't dye his hair. He is our third German Shepherd, and I don't want to think about how long it will be until he doesn't want to or can't hop in the back seat of our Volvo, of my Volvo station wagon, which I will drive until, like me, it stops running. I sat on the green metal bench and watched him sniff a friendly chocolate poodle. I realized I was hoping and praying I, was, I wasn't going to have to sit through yet another lackluster party where nobody even thinks about dancing until they hear a song you have to be damn near 70 to remember, which I suppose now includes me. And that's if you call doing a cha-cha-cha in flats or espadrilles or two-inch wedges with rubber soles to, the, to a beat they all hear differently dancing. I don't. I watch music videos on YouTube and I find myself rocking my future size 12 hits, swinging and swaying my shoulders and popping my fingers to the likes of single ladies or uptown funk by that little cute Bruno Mars until I have to wipe my forehead. I have not forgotten how to dance. In fact, sometimes Carl will sit in his leather recliner, lean way back and just watch me swirl around in my three inch heels, which I wear to work every day because I like to appear glamorous. And in this moment, in those moments, I feel pretty and sexy and 40. Carl just nods his head like he's agreeing and pops his fingers until the smile on his luscious lips begins to disappear. Then he might hold up his index finger, suggesting that I give him a minute but don't stop dancing, and slowly push himself up to a standing position, and limp down the hallway to take one of his little blue pills. Oh hell, here I go again, meandering. I'm just gonna have to stop apologizing for it be before I'm just going to have to stop apologizing for it because from what I've been reading my a in my AARP newsletter, this is only the beginning. Though truth be told, forgetting what I was talking about and going on tangents isn't completely new to me. Back in my 20s, I smoked a lot of reefer with my friends. We'd all sit in a circle on the floor on giant pillows and have deep conversations about the purpose of life or something having to do with God or how we were going to change the world. But then we'd all stop talking because we were suddenly mesmerized by the lava lamp. Then somebody would realize they were one step away from freaking out and would jump to a standing position in order to snap out of it. And then they'd say, what the fuck were we just talking about again? And since not one of us had a clue, we just start passing a joint until the next philosophical inquiry overtook our minds. But thank God I got tired of thinking about things that didn't matter and realized I liked the way I felt when I was, wasn't under the influence of anything. And when I didn't like how I felt, it was a hell of a lot easier to figure out how to deal with it when my head was clear. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, Did you uh, record the audiobook yourself? Yes. That's awesome. I, I've never, I haven't heard it. I never listened to my audiobooks because I don't like my voice. Well, I. I'm a man. It's a great audiobook. You did a great job. Thanks anyway. Well, let's talk a little bit about the book. Um, 
I don't think it's a spoiler to say that this is a story of um, a woman who has lost her husband. Nope, it's not a spoiler. It's not a spoiler, but I must say that I was quite shocked by it when I read it. I was just cruising along, enjoying her 68, you know, preparing for her birthday party and her adorable husband. And I felt like I was as shocked as she was when he died so suddenly in the first chapter. Me too. Really? Tell me more. I, I didn't know that was going to happen. I don't know. I don't have all of this stuff planned out. I don't, I don't plot my books. I don't plot them. I don't know what's going to happen in this chapter or that chapter. But when she gets to that, when they get to this uh, resort um, and she's up there looking at the chocolates and the champagne and stuff and she fell across the bed, I just said, oh, shoot. And I started crying and I just kept writing. And when she wakes up, um, she goes to that stairwell um, and um, you know, and I was a mess. I was a mess. And I was thinking, what is she going to do now? What is she going to do without him? I, and I mean, you know, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm in charge here. But the bottom line is I'm not in charge. It wasn't for me. You know that. We are not in charge. And I was like, you know what? I mean, there he was. And I was a mess. I cried like a baby. Well, I, you know, I was really moved by it too because he was such a, a solid man, not a, not a kind of a overly romanticized man. He, this is one of the many gifts in your work in that you write people that they're not, they don't seem like they jumped, jumped out of a television show. They don't seem like actors. They seem like, like people. And when he was, when he died, I felt like that's a good person. That's a good person that died. And I did ask myself, what is she going to do? And this is a story about, I think, about loss and repair. Yeah, um, maybe recovery. Same thing, I guess. No different. Um, I think recovery is better. Well, I'll put it this way. I mean, there are a lot of things that happen to us in our lives when we don't anticipate it. And it can ch change everything. And it's not always death. You know, um, it can be a pandemic, you know. You know, somebody can just hurt your feelings and, and change everything, tell you something you didn't want to know. But um, I think more than anything, I was, I was also interested in, I mean, because my big question was, what is she going to do now? What is she going to do now? And I was like, I don't know. So I just had to go with her. I mean, I think I, I thought I knew who she was. And I usually kind of know my characters you know, what their idiosyncrasies are and what propels them and emotionally what lifts them and what makes them fall. But this was different. And um, to me, as you know, that's the beauty of what we do. You know, um, I don't know. If I did know, I wouldn't waste my time. Well, I think one of the things that it's always just so intriguing about your work is how much how dedicated you are to writing the contemporary moment. It seems like your muse is the, the moment where the moment you're in. Your characters are going through life at the same pace that you are. Um, Loretta is turning 68 this year. You know, we think about all the way back to Mama, which was a coming of age story. What is it about the now? I know a lot of writers have dedicated, have found, as, a, as people say, their ministry is writing the stories that our grandmothers couldn't or wouldn't tell. And I think that's really important. But I've always thought, like, if I'm writing my grandmother's story, then my granddaughter will write my story. Like, at what point are we going to write it forward? And I feel like you are providing an example of writing the right now. What does that mean to you? You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think of it that way. Um, I write about what's bothering me right at the moment. And sometimes it is timely. You know what I mean? Um, I guess. Um, you know, I mean, I just turned 68. But also, you know, I've lost a lot of friends and family members who are younger than I am. And, um, you know, my thing was, how do you start over? How do you start over when you didn't know you had to? Um, and especially later in life. And also, how do you realize that life isn't over at 50 or 60 or 70? It's not over. And my thing is, is even now I want to live up to the last minute. 
you know, um, and break the rules and all of that. And I think to some extent, I didn't, Pat, I didn't create, um, what's her name? Loretha. Loretha. Um, Loretha. Um, I, she's not, she's not me. It's, I wish I could be her more like her. You know what I mean? Um, but you know, a lot of times tragic things happen to us and I'm not one for tragedies, um, up front. I don't like to play games with my characters or my readers, but I'm not thinking about my readers when I'm writing. I know you don't. Um, so did that answer your question? But I feel like there, this is a story in which something tragic happens, but it's not a tragic story. No, it's, I mean, not. This, it's a story of great hope. And it's also a story of humor. I mean, come on, there's a dog in here named B.B. King. Yes. And, yeah. her, and her mama keeps calling him Otis Redding. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that there's always humor in my books. Because, I mean, I can be depressed all by myself. I don't write to depress. I do not. But it doesn't mean that we don't experience some levels, some different types of tragedies, and also there is sadness in our lives. And I'm, I'm interested in writing about recovery on all levels. You know, because when you fall down, you have to get back up. I'm, I'm going to make sure you, my mother used to say that, you know, don't be crying all the time. Stop that crying. And the humor is so sincere. You know, some people say people laugh to keep from crying, but I feel like in your books, you laugh, people laugh because it's funny. They don't laugh because they're sad. They laugh because there is like actual joy, but you make these people work for their, things work out, but they have to work for it. Can you tell us a little bit about Loretha and her twin sister? Oh, honey. And they're, you know, they're fraternal twins. How does yeah, that work? I, I, you know, I made that. I mean, I, there's no twins in my family. Um, I, I don't write my stories. You know, I, I want to jump outside of my skin because I pretty much know what's going on in my life, you know. And I want to be, I write because I want to empathize with people that I may not. And uh, uh, Loretha's sister, I couldn't stand that hussy. Cool. I, could not, I did not like her. And I tried to be democratic, but it was hard. Um, but she's, you know, they're, 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 they're twins, but they're not really twins. They were born on a different day and a different year, but you know, I, I, I believe too, that sometimes families, you have family members that you don't necessarily get along. In some cases, I know people in families that they don't even like each other. And I kind of like that idea. Um, but they love each other, but sometimes it's hard to love people even when they're in your family. Yeah, you know, I'm surprised that you say you don't like her. I mean, I can see why one wouldn't like her, but one thing is you do not write with a judgmental pen. That is one thing throughout all the books. I feel like you write, you write, with, you write people the way people are, and it's almost like the book provides them a safe space to be themselves. So then as a reader, we get to see, you know, okay. She was a bitch. Well, some people yeah. are. But she was, but I don't know. I kind of, I felt like you encouraged me to try to get her, to try to understand. So did, her. I. So did I. So did I. I mean, I didn't write her like, you know. I mean, I tried. And I ended up did loving her. I, I ended up loving her. I mean, and she surprised me. She surprised me. I said, she has a heart that really beats. <laughs> I, I, see, I, I saw it in there from, from the very beginning. Now, a Terry McMillan novel wouldn't be a Terry McMillan novel if it were not the story of friends. Can you tell us a little bit about these friends? Well, I'll put it this way. A lot of, uh, I mean, I have friend, I've had friends like them, but I didn't, we don't do the things that they do. So I just created this fantasy. Like, you know, they all have different personalities. They've known each other since high school. I don't know any of my friends anymore from high school, a few of them, but, um, and I wanted them to lead completely different lives, but such that they still respected and admired and loved each other. And they were more like sisters and they were actually closer to each other than some of their own siblings because they didn't have to be pretentious. They could be honest when they hurt, they could tell each other when they were sad, blue, if something tragic was happening in their lives, they always knew they could depend on each other. And I've, I've got friends um, that I've known 25, 30 years. Um, you know, one of my BFFs, she, I forgot she was at my, she was there when my son was born in New York. And, you know, I was like, Val, 
do we really go back? Yes, we go back that far. Um, but we, I don't know. I've, I've got some friends in my life that we trust each other. And that's what's important. And we respect each other because all of us, no matter how old you are, you will go through some stuff that is going to be difficult to handle. Sometimes we keep secrets. And there are certain people that you know you can tell your secrets to and they will not judge you. Or even if they do judge you, it's not going to be forever. <laughs> that's because a feeling like this, yes, this, this safe space to be your yeah. authentic self. You know, yeah. you mentioned um, your son. This book is also about parenting. It's about parenting adult children. Yes. And I, like and I think that is an underexplored subject. And it's about being the sandwich generation with the mother and the adult children. There is Loretha in the middle. Well, I'll put it this way. I, I you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, I, I know of and I read a lot about a lot of families whose children don't live up to their expectations. And sometimes they, parents are just disappointed in their children, but sometimes there are reasons for it. You know, um, and I have known of, not so much my family, but I've known about mental illness in our communities, in our families. And there are a lot back when we were younger, it was a shameful thing. You know, you wouldn't dream of going to talk to a psychologist as an African American, you know, and then somebody would just give you a pill and that wouldn't do it. Or sometimes people self-medicate. And I really wanted to explore that um, because we judge each other sometimes too harshly. And, um, and mental illness is a big deal everywhere and not just in our communities but now i think that we have finally started to accept the fact that it is not a weakness or a character defect it's an illness and there are things that we can do to manage it and don't be ashamed of it is nothing to be ashamed of nothing i mean it is such part of one important thing too is that you know your work, every, I read on the back flap of this book that every one of your novels has become a New York Times bestseller, which means, oh, yeah. well, that's what they sent. That's what they're telling people. That's a lie. <laughs> well, that's all right. It's a lie that I like. I'm, I'm taking that and running with it. Because what I'm thinking about is the sheer popularity of your work helps to get that message out. There have been other things written about this topic of mental illness and substance abuse, but I feel like your work is in a format where it is accessible where, you know, I was sitting there on my front porch reading this and I didn't feel like I was eating my spinach or doing my homework, but it gave me, it, you gave me a word that I needed to hear in, in a format that I wanted to hear it. it. It made me want to turn the pages. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. It's, that is just the truth. I mean, I just, well, you open, I want to just say, I want to compliment you and say that you, one of the many ways that you have opened doors for other writers is that you you reintroduce what I'm going to call the black page turner. You know, I just finished doing this um, thing for PBS about The Street by Ann Petrie. It was yes. published in 1946 and it sold, wow. it sold 1.5 million copies in 1946. Yep. And that was the first blockbuster by a black woman. And I think that it didn't really happen again until Waiting to Exhale. And it reminded. I don't know if that's true. A, a blockbuster like that, I always say, you know, those little short, chunky paper. I the color purple. That was, that was 82, but it was a different kind of thing. It was a different kind of thing. Okay, well, I don't keep tabs Just, just take this love, girl. Just take it, take it. But, okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that it, it opened, it was a contemporary story, which made it different than The Color Purple. It was a contemporary story and everyone was reading it. There was this thing on the, um, I would say on the Twitter, maybe sound like I'm a hundred years old, where Babyface was doing this watch along Wait, yeah. with Waiting to Exhale. And I was listening to the soundtrack and I was like, that was the soundtrack of my young adulthood. But then I thought, Waiting to Exhale itself, the book, that was the story track to For a Generation. It's true. And I just want to thank you for it. And thank you for opening that door through which so many of us have walked. I want to thank you here in front of however many people are here that I can't see. So many of us, thank you for that story. Now, would you be willing to read for us just a little bit more? You're welcome. Don't make me cry. 
can't help it. You made us cry with these books in a good way. I'll put it this way. Um, I think that there are so many fine young writers out here, yourself is on that list, and that a lot of us don't give ourselves permission to tell it the way we see it, to tell it the way we feel it, to tell it the way we want to see it, the way we want it to really be. And there's so many young writers out here who I just hope honor their voices and the world that they either live in or want to live in or the one that they perceive is something that they, they can own and honor and tell it in their own voices. That's what's a lot, that's, that's what I mean, I'm a voice person. And, you know, you know, literarily, you know, I don't think the New York Times is all that crazy about me as a literary writer, and I don't really care. But um, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But the bottom line is there are a lot of young writers out here um, who, who need to own their own voices. So that when I, when I pick up a book by you, I know Tiare wrote that book. And people that read my books and, you know, a Toni Morrison book, you don't even have to see her name on it. Yeah. And um, anyway, um, well, you, you know what is interesting? I got this cup. Someone sent it to me in the mail. It's an awesome. And I posted it online. You're on here. And I, there's my mentor, Pearl. And there's Bernice. Pearl yeah. yeah. And there's me and you. And Eric. Yeah. I put this cup. Up? Um, it, this woman who makes them, she goes by the Trini G. Um, she makes it. She mailed it to me. And she makes socks like this and, and bags. She's on Etsy. But um, I put this on Twitter. To, I was so proud of to show it off. And I was asking people if they could identify the women on this mug. And people were saying, oh, I see California Cooper. I see Bernice McFadden. And you said, recognize them. I've met them. Oh, yeah. And I was like, yes, you are a witness. You are a witness. Oh. What, what do you think has changed over the course of your career? And what has stayed the same? Um my career I don't know about all that um I don't I don't I don't really know all I know is is that um I just wish there were more of us I wish you know like the young sister that wrote the hate you give mm -hmm. uh, I mean that's powerful I just I just want us to be able to tell our stories especially like and not just because of the pandemic but there are young people out here who are going through what we didn't go through what i didn't go through and i want to know their stories i want to know what their problems are their issues what they what they what they wish for that they don't have and how different their lives are than what they thought it would should be and what their dreams are and i i, I want to know and that's all i did i basically was sort of like uh I don't know. I, I sort of documented what it was like to be 32 in New York City to some extent or growing up or where my mama was, what it was like to raise five kids. I didn't know what that felt like. And so I just wish that because there's so many of us out here, our lives are different. And what we these young people are going through, we didn't necessarily go through it. Love is the same. I don't care how old, what color, ethnicity, none of it. But the bottom line is, is that I, I want them to be braver and document what it is they see or what they wish they could see or do and um, and not be afraid of it because so many young people they seem so strong and all this and i just i just feel that i want to see how much how vulnerable they really are and own it and get past it but i'll read this little section this is one of my oh, favorites please do, please do this is quick okay um I thought I was borderline, I said to Dr. Alexopoulos. Are you sure? She looked like she was about to roll her eyes at me and then changed her mind. Numbers tell us everything. Well, I don't want to take any, take any pills. You don't necessarily have to take medication. There are injections you can give yourself. Was she nuts? I'm scared as hell of needles. Ma says she had to hold me down with, my, with her knee pressed against my chest to make me stay still for my shots when I was a kid and, and I kicked a few doctors in the process. You have to do one or the other. Either, either will help you lose weight. I believe I have lost eight or nine pounds. You have not. In fact, you've gained 12. I so do not like this bitch. Well, my husband of 24 years passed away five months ago. I made, and I made some good changes before that, but I got derailed. So I lied. 
because she didn't look like she was re like she would respect the truth. I hoped if Carl was listening that he would forgive me. I understand, she said, and I'm very sorry for your loss. The receptionist told me it was the reason you had canceled your last two appointments, but you need to focus on your health now. Since I was now sitting on the edge of the examination table, I started pulling on the tissue paper cover, tearing off the corners, and I jumped off and stood upright. She moved to the side as if I were going to harm her. Look, I said, I don't mean to sound combative, but I've heard of people reversing type two diabetes if they change their diet and exercise. Well, Mrs. Curry, for the past year and a half, I've been encouraging you to change your lifestyle, but you have not. And diabetes is the result of your not taking my advice. I have tried, I lied, but it's hard to break old habits. The truth is, I don't like exercising. I don't like to sweat and I like being lazy, but I suppose it really was time to make a change. It's not too late though, is it Dr. Alexopoulos? It depends, your age might have, make it a little tougher. I could have cut her the way I looked at her. What's my age got to do with anything? It's not like I've got stage three cancer or something. That's true, I didn't mean to frighten you. Well, you did, and I'm a little pissed to be honest with you. A burst of cool air from the vent made the thin blonde nest on her little head waft, waft to the side. I could see her pink scalp. I apologize, she said. I've never, I apologize, she said, with half an ounce of sincerity. It's okay, Dr. Alexopoulos. I have never really trusted you if you want to know the truth. You doctors are all alike. You aren't encouraging. You like to scare the hell out of people. You write prescriptions, don't cure the problem, just postpone it. Well, I'm I'm gonna find a doctor who has a better attitude about how a person can improve their health regardless of how old they are. She said nothing as I opened the door and walked out. I'll show her ass and I'll come back when my numbers prove her wrong, but not starting today. Because what I need before making this transition was a double cheeseburger, some soft fries, a Diet Coke and three farewell Twizzlers. After all, I needed to process the promise I just made to myself. She's so full of shit. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that is a very humorous scene, but it's about, you know, a really serious issue. Oh, wow. Now I can't see. Here I am. Yeah. Mm. But I feel like it's a humorous scene about a serious issue, right? There's a lot of talk about health throughout here. I mean, her and, husband. And, 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 and also fat shaming. Every you gain a couple of pounds and people think you're, you know, obese. Makes me, and I almost was guilty of it at first and it was brought to my attention. Well, it does seem that a lot of times people pretend to be concerned about your health, but really they just don't like the way you look. Thank you. And they get to say, oh, I'm, it's your health, but they don't care if you do other things that are unhealthy. And they just use that as a cover. But at the same time, you know, Loretta and her friends, you know, they take up walking and they, it's like that balance between caring for your health and not being giving in to this idea that you must look a certain way. Oh yeah. Well, they decided also that they, they, they decided that they were going to do whatever is necessary. Cause one of the, one of the women, the friends, she's like six one. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and she teaches, um, well, what is it called? Silver sneakers, but she teaches a hip hop class. And um, she's been trying to get her friends to come in there and they resist up until, you know, uh, quite a while. It takes a, a, ways, a while for that to happen. But, you know, um, and I mean, the one thing I do know is that, you know, nobody's trying to look 50. You know, and my attitude, even at 68, is that, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to look 55 or 60 or what. I know how old I am. And the bottom line is this, all I want to do, if at all possible, is to slide into home instead of being a contributor to my own health, death, be, be based on my negligence. Um, I, I, that's what, because, you know, but right now, I mean, I'm having a good time. And I walked a hill yesterday, but let me tell you, it was hard to sit down today. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, I mean, there is so much fun. What about when they go to Vegas? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the one thing I do know is that um, these characters, there's a yin and yang. You know, you can be friends with somebody, 
just like you can marry somebody, that, but there's certain things that he does that just piss you off, and but you just tolerate it. Well, they, that's these kind of, the, these are th these friends are like that. You know, one doesn't drink, one doesn't want to do this, one is a closet lesbian, and they have to bring it out by making her go to a strip club, and um, you know, but they love each other, and they know each other's faults and idiosyncrasies and shortcomings and their and and their virtues they know they know all that and they basically just try to give each other a little kick which is to me what good friends do you know if you got a friend that's been drinking too much you say something and you know I wrote on a little note card here that because because I thought I might get nervous and I needed to remember what I wanted to sure. say and I wrote here, I said, this is not so much a book about aging, but a book about living. Well, yeah, well, people do think technically after a certain age that it's all downhill. And that's how the title came to me. Because I was like, you know, I don't buy this. I don't buy this. You know, my mother died at 59 years old. And when I turned 59, I was thinking, oh, my God, I must be, you know, must be around the corner. But, you know, yeah, I, you know, and, 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 you know, I think that's one of the reasons, I mean, I don't drink, I haven't had a drink in 37 years, I don't eat sugar, I exercise, and, I, and it's not because I'm trying to look 50 or 60, it's because I just don't want to be responsible for my own demise, I don't, and there's too many people in my life that, in my family and lives that, that have died, you know, tragically, and, 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 and it was so unnecessary, but back then it's like there are things that we didn't know, but now we do know. And all I know is, is that we don't get a do-over. So, you know, if I can slide in the home, that's how I want to get there. I mean, even Loretha's husband, Carl, he didn't tell her, he didn't go get a procedure that could have saved him. People lie about a lot of things. People lie. And they lie to make things go smoother. But it doesn't ultimately go smoother, you know, because some, you're going to have to face it. That's just the bottom line. But at the same time, I will say this, and, you know, I also believe in humor, um, you know, and, and that's one reason why I don't write books. I, I mean, because I can be depressed all by myself, you know, I don't write to depress anybody. And, you know, but also I'm not trying to, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not Oprah. I love Oprah, you know, but I, no. I, know, <laughs> I know you love Oprah. I know you love Oprah. But the thing is, is that we all go through something. And to me, a good novel, you know this is how we get through things. And that's what, a good, that's what a good novel is. It doesn't mean it has to be a fairy tale, but we, that's, that's what, that's, that, that, I get that out of every book, out of every book. When I close, I'm usually in tears. I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. And I was thinking, because I'm so happy for these characters, that they got through this, that they didn't try to, even though they were trying to bullshit and skirt around it, I'm sorry for swearing. It's so like us. But, but they, you know, they try, you, you, you can't hide, you can't run. The longer it take, the longer you try to hide, the longer it's going to take you. And it's going to chase you. I don't care what it is. And, you know, that's one reason why I think that, you know, it's, it, it's important that we be good people, that we treat ourselves with respect. And everything that's going on now, um, and then what we heard about today about the brother in Wisconsin or Minnesota, wherever it was. Um, it's, there are just things that make our lives valuable. And, you know, all that's going on now that, and, uh, and the beauty of it to me is too, is that how many of us are trying harder to take care of each other. And it's like, it's, it's beautiful to me how far a lot of us are willing to go for each other during this some not so much, but um, I don't know. Well, one of the things I was wondering about this moment we're in, what are you doing to keep it together? Cause I feel like I am, I feel like I'm keeping it together, but I don't know how much longer I can keep it together. So what are you doing to keep it together during this crazy moment in history we're in? Um, well, I've been reading, I've been walking. Um, I talk to my friends on the phone, we run our mouths. And I've been watching a lot of CSI Miami and Law and Order. Really? You like to unwind with a little murder? Yeah, because I, you know, I can, I, I like to solve murders. <laughs> and it is something really satisfying about those kinds of shows because you, you figure them out 
Order is restored at the end. Well, a lot of times I don't figure them out, to be honest with you. But what I love is how smart some of them are. And plus, like on CSI, uh, not CSI, um, what was it? Law and Order, Criminal Intent, I was in love with him. What's his name? Here's a helpful hint for um, D'Onofrio. Here's a little hint. For, oh. This is how you solve anything on Law and Order. This is tried and true. <laughs> if there is a famous person, they did it. That's just the rule. If a famous person is on Law and Order, they did it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, the, but the thing is, is that what I love, I love, I think what I really always liked about this, I like how they solve problems. I like how they go under and around and over, and then they say, got you. Oh, yeah, you know? so you like Kremlin and Tech, because he's always like, wait a minute. Oh, he's always, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like back when the show was even popular, I liked it. And now I've just been doing, watching it because now, of the pandemic. Now it's like yeah. nostalgia viewing. So what, what do you read these days? What's on your nightstand? Hood Feminism. Oh, that's a good one. The Travelers. I haven't read that. Uh, I read short stories. Tommy Orange, which I haven't finished. I love him. Oh yeah, there they are. There, there. Yeah, he can write. I love his voice. And there's this this um uh, do not say we have nothing by Madeline. Oh, I haven't read that. She, uh, she's from she lives in Canada. Let me tell you. <laughs> See, that's the thing. Oh, you know, writers, they're always talking about books that are not yet out. If that looks like an early copy, is it out uh, yet? No, this has been out for a couple of years. It was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, oh. 2016. And I've had it, but the bottom line is so dense. But her writing, oh my goodness. And then I read short stories, and right now I'm reading short stories from the South. I love short stories. I love that. I love. No, and I read Ring Lardner. Tell everybody to bring, read Ring Lardner. Okay, from your lips to everyone watching this today. What do you want? Are you listening? Are you watching anything? I really, I need more content. I am, I am climbing the walls in this house. Um, are you listening to any podcasts? Like, I don't really listen to a lot of podcasts. You know, I mean, I don't really listen to a lot of podcasts. I mean, I spend, I spend time, I read, I don't read as much as I would like to. And, you know, I have about 100 pages, 125 pages on a new book. That was my and, next question. Wait, no, but wait, but I started a couple of years ago before this one. And, um, I was under the impression that it needed to sit someplace for a while. Um, and I got some really good advice um, about some of the problems. And so I just put it aside, but I thought that it wasn't just, it just wasn't good. And then I was corrected and, um, and I went back to it and, and I don't know, it's not like, it's not like being in a relationship and you break up and you realize why you broke up and you still love that person and you go back and realize, oh, this is all that was wrong and let's fix it. And so that's what I did. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled, but right now the pandemic has stopped me from, I can't worry about them right now because I'm worrying about myself and all of us. Um, and it's just hard to go there, but it's okay because I have enough pages. And um, so I'm reading, I'm, I'm on a binge. I went, I have a stack of old bookshelves and I have one in my bedroom that's not that tall. And I went and put all these books that I'm determined to read, hopefully in the next two months. And um, I just pull them out. And that's where I went, I got these when I thought you might ask me. Um, I'm trying to read um, short things too. I can't, during this pandemic, I can't concentrate. I'm having a hard time. I feel like for me, the writing, writing works best for me when my writing is the most interesting thing happening. And during this pandemic, I mean, I'm so panicking about the world. And then I see the news and it seems like I'm in my house, you're in your house, other people out socializing, other people out being racist. Like what is happening? I'll put it this way. I mean, you know, I just, um, I just feel like we shouldn't be going through this. And I don't want to start preaching here, but um, I just think that a lot of us are going to be stronger 
and closer. A lot of us are going to be clear headed about what's important, what's not important. We know what's our, not our fault. And I think some of us, especially when it comes to voting, will realize how much power we do have and that the love that we are showing for each other and the respect for our country and each other, that's what I'm getting out of this. And we are being kinder to each other, the people that are kind. Um, and that's what I think is going to ultimately be the beauty of what's ugly. Um, I just, I just feel it, and I, and I'm not, and it's not magical thinking, um, but we should not be going through what we're going through. People out here suffer enough, and you know my bills are paid. And I was thinking about people who can't pay their rent, mm -hmm. you know, who don't have a job anymore. Maybe I mean I don't know, you know, and and you know. It's, this, is a, this is a major, a monumental test. And I just feel that we are going, the majority, a lot of us are going to pass it. And we see it every day. People are humble. They're scared, but they are humble. And people are being kinder for the most part, except some people in, that, you know, don't get me started. But at any rate, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get through this. And... Um, because I think we know what the secrets are. Yes, and I think we can rely on what our ancestors had, mm -hmm. have shown us. We have, I'm going to vote by mail, that's all I can say. Yeah, I'm going to vote by mail and yeah, we, yes. Okay, we, we have questions. We do, we all have to vote and everyone has to get one other person to vote. Okay, um, here's a question for you. Oh, this is a really good question. What was your writing process from the beginning of the idea of a book to the completed manuscript? How did you go about organizing your stories? You said that you don't, you don't outline. I don't either. So you just sit there and just let her rip and just see what happens. Yeah. You know, I, you know, when it's a multiple character story, I sort of figure out which characters are in the story, but the, the protagonist, the main character, I usually know there is a trigger there's something that makes me jump into this story, into this character's life right now. Because I don't have all day to tell it, you know? Um, and I'm worried about what this character is going through. I mean, really worried. And the bottom line is, is that I think that I always believe that I don't try to write about characters who are perfect or who are victims. Victims to me are boring. I write about, they are boring, I, I, you know, because it means they have no power. I write about characters who fall down, and this story, to some extent, is going to be how they're going to get back up, how they're going to get through whatever it is that has happened to them. Because I'm not writing a fairy tale, you know what I mean? I'm writing a story that hopefully represents a real, stuff that real characters go through. How do you know when you're finished? because they have evolved. They have, sometimes they don't exactly get what they wanted, but they're further ahead than they were and they've learned something and they're stronger. They're stronger. And if it happened again, they would do it differently, but never, that, that usually doesn't happen. If something else happens and we are always tested and always tested. And, you know, we get stronger, hopefully as we get older, if we learn anything about what we've been through so that you don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again and and lean on people. That is the hardest thing to learn, to learn. Some people, just like in the book, are really good at providing help and they're not good at asking for help. Here's a sweet question for you. What was a lovely moment in your day? Today? Or yesterday, I'll take any loveliness I can get. Um, I walked, I went for a nice walk. And I mean, a really nice walk. And I don't live far from the Rose Bowl. And I used to walk with another woman, but before, before the pandemic and we had to stop. And um, I knew that I, you know, I was kind of taking the easy route. And something said, Terry, you know, she showed you how to walk down this hill, what you could do, how to get back up the hill. And so I walked. 
I walked. And when I walked up to this, got to this hill, I walked down it. And then when I turned around to start walking back up, it was killing me. And I remembered what she said, Terry, turn around and walk backwards. Oh. And I did up the hill. And then when I, when I got a little hard, I turned around and walked the other way. And there, was, there were older people on the other side of the street. They weren't walking backwards. They were just walking. But I could tell they lived in a neighborhood. But then I did it twice or whatever, however many times. And then I looked up and I saw that street sign. And I was like, you made it. I made it. Well, here's something lovely that happened to me. I FaceTime with a baby. This is the cutest oh, whoa. Thing. Baby says good night to <laughs> anything it perceives to have a blanket. So I had a, a towel on my shoulders so my hair was wet. And he said, good night. And oh. his mama says that he says good night. Like when he passes a barbecue grill, you know, the little cover over the grill. He says, good night. <laughs> and I you know, what a, oh, just a lovely open hearted baby saying, he says good night to the sofa when that little, you know, the little throw on the edge of the sofa, he passed it and says, good night. And that was the, the lovely thing that I kept with me for like three days, the good night baby. I love it. I love it. Okay, wait a minute. What are we asking? What, what was my name? You need, she needs to send us up some more questions, question sender uppers. Has this pandemic inspired your writing in any way? Yes, I don't write. <laughs> I know, right? But we will. Don't worry. She's gonna, if she doesn't pass us up some more questions, I'm going to start asking because I have some questions. Oh, look, here, they, here comes some more. Okay, let me put my glasses on. Nobody told me about this glasses thing. Oh, honey. It's like about three years ago. I couldn't see a damn thing. I don't know what happened. Okay, here we go. Which one? I think, I think about this one that says... Oh, okay. As a young writer, Ms. McMillan, that would be you. How did you learn to step out of the way to allow your characters to speak no matter what their stories were, specifically when you mentioned their stories were not your stories? Um, well, first of all, you know, one of the things that a lot of people have thought about me is that all my stories are autobiographical. They are not. You know, I mean, one, maybe close, but even then I lie my butt off, you know, but I lie in such I a way. you create. Thank you. I want, I mean, even the whole thing with my ex-husband and stuff, you know, how I met him was true, but all the other stuff, that was a lie. One lie is, and that's what a good novel is, is a continuous lie that you write in order to tell the truth um, or tell the truth or so that it's believed. But, um... What was the question again? I'm sorry. How do you get into the voices that are not your own? Because like particularly I, in this book, there's so many voices. How did you inhabit people of so many different experiences? And I'm also gonna just jump in and say, one thing I really love about this is how the people are of so many different socio, I'm gonna hold the book up so people can remember, but how many socioeconomic groups are in the book because that is a thing I think about black life is that there are so pe many people on so many levels within the same family. But how did you step into all those different shoes? I don't know. I know you just did it. It's your gift. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. I know one thing it, that, you know, you can't, I don't write fairy tales, you know, so I deliberately sort of pick characters who rub each other the wrong way or don't really understand each other. Maybe not totally, I don't want to say respect, but some people are a lot more sympathetic and empathetic. Some people have a sense of humor. Some people don't. Some people are patient. Some people are impatient. Some people are judgmental. Some people are pushovers. And so, you know, I try to pick characters that, they, they have a good effect on each other, and in some cases, a negative effect. But that effect, whatever it is, that has something to do with what fuels the story. Because to me, every story is an unfulfilled wish. And you, you want something and you can't get it. And if it's love, if it's peace, if it's a job, if it's to lose a few pounds, if it's just to feel good, um, whatever. But the bottom line is, is that there's something you want. Otherwise, you know, I call it, otherwise I'd be, it'd be literary masturbation. I mean, they, they want something. Something is wrong with their lives right now. And that's where I'd come in, 
you know, and I, and I, I don't, I don't, you know, they got to earn how this book ends. They have to earn it, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. I go right along with them, but, um, you know, and I never know how a book is going to end ever, 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 ever. I didn't know her husband was going to pass away. And that was the first chapter. I was like, Oh, sh I was a mess. I couldn't even finish when she saw that cheese and all this stuff on the table. I was already crying. The yellow gift like, box. Don't forget the yellow gift box. Oh, I was like, Lord have mercy. Here's another question, Terry. Um, the person says, they, I really appreciate that your catalog includes black women across ages and time. Will you ever go back and write younger characters as center points? Or do you no longer have an interest in telling those stories? I don't have an interest in telling those stories. Well, I don't know. I don't you know. never say never. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, I have written something from, a, uh, I have some stuff, I've got lots of stuff in here that i I have written from a child's point of view, but not a novel. Um, and I don't, I don't, uh, I'll put it this way. I don't think that my next book is going to be about somebody who's 72. <laughs> no, no. But, um, but I like writing from men's points of view too. They don't get enough. And I wish we had more ma male writers out here, um, straight and gay, um, whatever. Um, we just need more male voices, and there are not enough of them. There aren't. All ethnicities, we need more men to write because they have their feelings are important, and um, you know their feelings are important, really important. And I think that not only will other men understand some men better, but women will understand some of them better if they are honest. And we did have quite a few back in the day. Um, but we don't have very many now, and I wish we did. I think that it's really interesting in publishing because women publish more books and men win more prizes. So that when, <laughs> it's true, it's that women, women do the bulk of the reading and the writing, but men are more likely to get the accolades. It's a very strange um, kind of industry. Um, okay, we've just gotten the, the, they're gonna send us out, the hook out for us, so I'm gonna ask you, um, one last question. Let me see which will be the last. Oh, it's so hard for me to choose which one of these will be the last one. I guess I'm going to ask you the question. This is kind of open-ended. It's kind of big, but I think it's very appropriate. There are a lot of people out there who have books they want to write. Like you said, you want more men to write. And I think I want more people to write. What how do you stay inspired is the question. And what advice would you give to other people who have a story that they want to tell? Write without thinking it's going to be published. Don't write, don't look over your shoulder and write without stopping. Don't edit as you go along. Just keep writing. And don't go back and tr don't go back, you know, and you know, you write from here. You write from right here. This is what edits. This is what you use to revise, okay? And write as if no one's ever gonna read it and then go back and read it. Do you write by hand? Do you use your typewriter? Oh, no. I use a typewriter. A typewriter, typewriter? Typewriter, typewriter. Ooh, no. I type like almost 200 words a minute, honey. I type on a, on this, uh. whoops, whoops, uh-oh. Uh oh! Now, you, make, you make me want to walk over here and get my typewriter because it's right. Wait, wait! What did I do? I can't see you. What? <laughs> you just, I hit the key. What did I do? Oh, that's all right. I'm over here. You don't have to see me. I look the same. I can see you. I know. I type. No, I type really fast. My first job was. I, I, I mean, after being a, a working at a, a, my first job was at a library, but um, no, um, I type really fast. I can type as fast as I think. Which may not be that fast. That is lightning fast. Okay, they're coming out here with a hook. So I just want to say before we wrap thank it up, Sarah McMillan, I want to thank you for this conversation. But I want to thank you for, I want to thank you on behalf of the culture. Thank you for everything you've done. And we are looking forward to what you will do in the future because it is not downhill from here. Thank you, Tiara. You too, honey. It's been a pleasure. We know what you've added. Okay. <laughs>